Okay, so next we're gonna get uh, Tim Bell. <laughs> Tim, first of all, uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, it's your second time in Israel, I understand, after 20 years uh, being in a kibbutz. Uh, so things have changed a little bit. Uh, this is the corridor, and uh, where's the other speaker? Uh, microphone? Okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay, great. So thanks a lot for the invitation to come along and talk to you about how we are addressing the frontiers of clouds and science together through collaboration. So um, I'm from CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. Um, it's a laboratory uh, on the boundary between France and Switzerland, uh, Mont Blanc in the background and the Jura Mountains in the front. A few things about me. Um, so. I'm responsible for the compute infrastructure at CERN. Um, amongst other things, we run the OpenStack cloud. Um, prior, prior to that, I used to work for Deutsche Bank, doing infrastructure for private banking, and with IBM as a kernel developer. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, I happen to be an elected member for the OpenStack Foundation Board, so thank you very much for the community and for all the voting. Please continue to participate in that and choose the representatives. And the other my detail is I have an antimatter factory in my parking lot. <laughs> and for those of you that have read Angels and Demons, it is a work of fiction. So what is CERN? CERN is the European Laboratory of Particle Physics. Um, we are founded about 60 years ago as a place where we could do fundamental research. So this is understanding the universe, how it works, what it's made of. It's a site that supports about 12,000 scientists from around the world, about 100 different countries. So if you imagine organizing teams like that, it's an interesting cultural challenge as well as a technical one. The budget, it's about a billion Swiss francs a year, so about four billion shekels. Um, that amounts to roughly one to two cups of coffee per person in the member states. We're currently largely based in Europe, but gradually expanding out. And in fact, the last member to join, Israel, joined in 2014. Um, and as you see from there, there is an extending list of accession countries. So along with the antimatter factory and various other experiments, we're also hosting the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is the largest piece of scientific equipment in the world. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. It takes about 20 minutes to drive from one side to the other. And the protons that we fire around there, so hydrogen nuclei, go around about 19,000 times a second, um, just below the speed of light. The actual accelerator itself is 100 meters underground. Um, this is to protect it from uh, radiation that's coming from the sun. There's actually a significant amount of solar radiation that comes, and this way we shield the accelerator. There are four detectors that are positioned around the ring, and we use the previous generations of accelerators as a way of boosting the protons up to full speed. If you get a chance to go underground, and there are some opportunities occasionally to do so, but you wouldn't want to do so at the moment while the accelerator is running, you'll see a large number of blue tubes. Um, these tubes house inside magnets. There are about 9,600 of them that had to be lowered down 100 meters through a series of tunnels. And inside there, you'll find two one centimeter pipes. And this is the pipes through which the protons are sent around in opposite directions. The pipes themselves, in order to avoid that the protons collide with gas uh, particles, are evacuated. Um, this uses very sophisticated vacuum technology to get down to about the pressure of outer space, 10 times less than on the moon. Wrapped around these pipes are niobium-titanium cables. Um, the reasons why this is chosen is because there is a very interesting property of this material, which if you freeze it down to minus 271 degrees centigrade, so that's just above absolute zero, then it becomes superconducting. You can put very high currents through this and create very strong magnetic fields to bend the particles around. This needs about 120 tons of liquid helium. So it's a significant share of the liquid helium production for the planet when you're cooling it down. At the same time, we've got quite a big electricity bill. Um, so it's about $30 million a year to power all this. 200 megawatts, about the same as a small town. And you'll see dotted around the area, uh, it's largely in the countryside around uh, CERN, um, a series of power stations. Unfortunately, for those of you that follow the news recently, um, there was a small animal 
which uh, wandered into one of these power stations and unfortunately found what happens at 66,000 kilovolts <laughs> and you short circuit. In fact, the accelerator was out for a few days while we did the repairs. So the four experiments. Um, Atlas, 7,000 tons, about the height of the Eiffel Tower, a general purpose detector. And this is the one where the largest Israeli contribution is. Um, from Technion, University of Tel Aviv, and the Weizmann Institute, um, there are a significant number of people who then work and contribute amongst the 3,000 people working on Atlas. It can be viewed as a 100 megapixel camera. It takes 40 million pictures a second. Alice. Alice is an experiment looking at heavy ions. So 10% of the time, we send round lead nuclei rather than protons. This is 200 neutrons and protons in a nucleus. We collide those, creating conditions very close to the Big Bang. It's about 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. And the Alice detector is designed to be looking at this detail. CMS is the second general purpose detector. Why do we need two? The reason behind that is that to validate any scientific discovery, you need to have independent mechanisms. And so it was the ATLAS and CMS experiments who together identified the Higgs boson in 2012, for which Professor Higgs and Englert received the Nobel Prize. LHCB looks at the interesting problem of antimatter and matter. Um, as you may notice, we're largely matter, not half and half. Yet theory, in theory, we ought to be about 50-50, because in the end, the Big Bang created identical matters of antimatter and matter. Why is it that we don't see the antimatter anymore? And LHCB is looking at that. The end result of all this is we collide the particles, we get multiple collisions, and this produces around one petabyte every second. Um, we can't store all this. Um, it would cost too much. Um, so we filter that data down to around 25 gigabytes a second, which then gets sent to the CERN computer center for recording. Now, facing these technology challenges, naturally, although it's not a fundamental goal of CERN, creates a set of spin-offs. So the magnet technologies that we use are the same magnet technologies that are then adapted and used in medical scanners. Hadron therapy, using particle accelerators to produce direct beams of protons to focus on tumors. Solar panels, using the vacuum technology to make them maximally efficient. The first capacitive touch screen was invented at CERN in the 1970s. So when you bring your smartphone out, uh, it used to look like that picture there. Uh, it's not quite so convenient. And finally, the World Wide Web invented at CERN in the 90s in order to allow physicists to share information together. So if you imagine a world without the capacitive touch screen and without the World Wide Web, it would be very significantly different. So when the data gets sent to CERN, we record it at what's known as the tier zero. This is the area that my team's responsible for. And then after that, we send it round to a number of other sites. There are 12 tier ones that also record part of the data. And then finally, 170 other locations, um, one of which is based here in Tel Aviv. However, as always with physics, there's the problems of running today, but there's also the problems of looking forward to tomorrow. In the same way that in the 1980s, people imagined a scenario where potentially they could invent superconductivity and plan the design of the LHC before many technology parts were complete. We're having to do the same thing on the computing side. And when we look out towards the plans for the physics, Come 2023, we'll be looking at around 400 petabytes a year to record. Computing needs, if Moore's law is followed, would be around 16 times what we have today, and we'd probably need around the order of 50 times. So therefore, we have to have a fundamental rethink in terms of how do we run our infrastructure? How can we make it so that we use everything we have to the maximum efficiency, but also ensure that we maintain a flat uh, budget, we maintain a steady state of staff, so that we don't end up increasing significantly our total costs. So a few years ago, we had a sit down, started off with blank pieces of paper, and thought, now, how do we go from here? What should we do? What can we be building using the experiences of other large centers rather than inventing everything ourselves? It's a cultural shock for a research organization to be not doing research, but to actually be looking at using things from outside. So the first step was to expand the infrastructure. We asked the member states of CERN to make us proposals for a uh, building. Um, we expanded the second data center into the Budapest, uh, Hungary, in Hungary. And 
The second center is about 2.7 megawatts. The CERN one's about 3.5 megawatts. Um, so now we have the computing infrastructure. However, we then need to start looking at the people and tools questions. So we established a set of basic rules that said, where were we spending time? And we were spending a lot of time training up our staff because we had custom tools we'd written ourselves. Instead, if we were using open source tools, we were able to then take the benefit of standard publications, books you can buy on Amazon. Often the university people were coming to CERN already knowledgeable about these technologies from having learned them at university. At the same time, we wanted the CERN staff to be finishing their times at CERN. Many people are working on contracts of three or five years' time and go back to their member states. We wanted it that when they went back to their member states, they were going back with a directly relevant set of skills where they were then able to find job opportunities. And this means finding thriving open source communities that then allow those people to immediately pick up jobs. So we went through a set of tools. It didn't take very long. You don't necessarily need to choose the best tool all the time, but choosing something and then adapting the way that you work is a very good way of learning the right tools to be using rather than writing long requirements lists that might not be the right way. Puppet for configuration management, getting those servers consistent. Kibana, Elasticsearch for monitoring. And in particular, OpenStack using the RDO distribution for the delivery of a cloud service. We started probably end of 2011. Um, 2012 was the first time we actually had anything we showed to a very brave set of users. But after a couple of releases, we got to a point where we felt that we could maintain this in production. So this means for our users, they could create a virtual machine and we would make sure that that virtual machine would carry on being available. They wouldn't need to recreate it. So in July 2013, we went into production and then gradually from there built out a number of further projects and functionalities. Some of them we try out for a bit and then scratch, and we'll come back to a bit later. It's quite natural that with an open source community, with a thriving ecosystem, there'll be some projects which are more mature than others, and it's important that you should equally be able to consider something and then choose not to offer it to your user community if it doesn't work out right. However, OpenStack as such is just a basic set of functions. The core in, this is a chart from Subu from eBay, um, the core functionality there comes from OpenStack. But when you're looking at situations like we have 200 people who arrive at CERN and leave, now if each one of those left behind a virtual machine, then you would soon find your cloud was filled full. There wasn't a, a credit card that would be charged and therefore their accounts wouldn't be debited, they wouldn't have a reason to delete. So you need to put in place life cycle management, capacity planning, <coughs> all of these extra things that's more than just taking the code from RDO, installing it and uh, bringing it up. So where are we now? Um, so three years in, the CERN cloud, the one that my team runs, is, is the blue box there. Um, that's about 150,000 cores at the moment. Um, there are actually three additional clouds in the experiment areas. And those are these trigger farms that were filtering the data down from one petabyte to 25 gigabytes a second. And those farms then allow you to um, do that processing. But when the accelerator isn't running, they spin up OpenStack on them. And then with that, they use them for physics computing as well. Current installations ongoing at the moment, um, we've just got 60,000 additional cores in from the lorries, and they're currently unpacking them and burning them in. Um, so in total, about 90% of CERN's compute infrastructure is now running on top of OpenStack. It's, it's not just a technology problem. Um, as many people have mentioned, it is a cultural thing. And it's important that while we look at how we advance culture, you'll find some people in a team rapidly understand and adopt these technologies, continuous integration, continuous deployment. But it's important in the same way that Hooke's law says you shouldn't deform a spring by putting too much pressure on it, that we also concentrate on the people who have applications which are not so easy to run in cloud environments, who maybe need a little bit more training and a bit a little more explanation in order to adopt some of these techniques. It's very important that the IT team stays together rather than deforming under load. One of the ways to do this is to expose the team to open source communities. Um, just seeing how OpenStack works, the amazing work that's done by the infrastructure team, for example, really helps people to understand the benefits that you can get from these approaches. 
So it was with great honor that we were awarded the OpenStack Super User Award in Paris in 2014. And even now, those people still take that as being an extremely high moment of their careers. Uh, it may be your manager saying good job is one thing. Having someone who has been mentoring you, reviewing your code, and gives you a plus two is a lot more positive reward for those people. So thoughts on what we've learned. Um, as Jesse said earlier, it's very important to take a good look at how you're going to deploy OpenStack. There's lots and lots of choice, but it requires a very strong assessment of the skills of your organization. How much risk are you willing to take? What's your need for speed as opposed to your need for consolidation and costs of reduction? So look through those options between private cloud as a service through to running off trunk, but do it with a very strong assessment of the skills of your staff. There is an English proverb of painting the fourth road bridge. Um, this is because you start off painting one side of the fourth road bridge, and by the time you get to the other end, you've got to start painting all over again. And rolling out OpenStack is like that. Um, six month cycles. By the time you've gone through all the projects, we normally incrementally upgrade each individual project. So there'll be a phase where we'll upgrade Cinder, and then another one where we'll upgrade Keystone. And we run in parallel with multiple different versions. But that means that within a six month cycle, we aim to get everything done and not fall behind. Falling behind just leaves you disconnected from the future developments, it makes it more difficult for you to contribute upstream. So it's very worthwhile trying to keep that cadence going. Maybe you'll need external help in order to do it, but keep it going. There is, with the big tent now, so much technology. Um, this is an Apple Newton for anyone who remembers them. Um, and it, to my mind, was a fine example of something where the technology wasn't quite there. When you think of the iPhones and the iPads that came out afterwards, in many ways, you can date it back to this technology. And looking around at the big tent, it's important to make that calculation. Are you looking at something which is a Newton state, i.e. it's going to be getting better, but don't look at it now? Or are you looking at something which is the first edition of the iPhone? So be a bit cautious. Some of the projects seem very, very interesting. Maybe try them out a little bit, but equally, diving them into a production service where you then have to be dependent on providing that to the user community can be a risk. And then finally, as a private cloud provider, as Jesse said, this consistency problem is there. And it's very, very difficult when you have people coming along and saying, I've had a look at your web page, and you only offer me the following flavors. No, what I want is the following SSDs, 10 gig interface, make it happen. And Depending on the structure that you have in your organization, you will need to have management support in order to be able to say no and keep those total cost of ownerships down. So not everything ought to be on the menu, no matter how strongly someone asks, because in the end, that's what's going to drive your costs up. So three areas that we've been working on. Um, Nova cells, it's a key part in scaling clouds. Um, so we run 50 cells. These are independent small OpenStack instances that you bind together with a higher level API gateway. So the users see this as being a single cloud, but underneath we can manage them as smaller units. This in particular allows us to have a single cloud split between two data centers transparently for the end users. There's a new version of that coming along where actually every single OpenStack cloud will be a cell and we're contributing upstream in order to make that implementation. So you'll all be getting this functionality soon, which makes the upgrade paths a lot more straightforward in future. Federation, so Federation, we've been collaborating with Rackspace in the CERN Open Lab, which is industry collaboration uh, structure. And here, this allows us to authenticate against one OpenStack cloud and then use resources in another. The end effect of that is that we're able to federate with multiple other clouds, both in high energy physics, at the trigger farms, and also public clouds in a transparent fashion for our end users. That project has been in production now. All the code is upstream. And with that, then Rackspace and CERN have moved on to now starting to have a look at containers. Um, there's a technology called Jupyter Notebooks, which is very attractive for the physicists. A web page, you store your paper in it, your code, your data. And in the end, you get an interactive environment. So for the users, they wanted this. For the IT department, as always, these things are a bit of a challenge. You have to set up a new service. However, by building this on top of the existing OpenStack infrastructure using the Magnum project, we were able to bring it online in a few months because we were able to build off the security infrastructure, the onboarding, the monitoring that we'd already got in place. So we didn't have to set up a new service from scratch. 
looking out. So we've clearly got a set of basic work to do. Um, another 100,000 cores coming towards the end of the year. Um, we need to maintain now also the retirement of old hardware, um, which has got less power efficient and therefore will be replaced by new equipment. We're keeping track of what project's development is going on. In particular, it's very important to follow developments such as deprecation. Um, the EC2 API for Amazon compatibility that used to be in Nova is now a separate project. So you need to work with upstream. We've done the packaging work for RDO, um, and therefore with that, we're then able to distribute that and roll that out across the cloud. Um, we started with Nova Network because at the time Neutron wasn't available. So we now have ahead of us the prospect of basically migrating 25,000 virtual machines concurrently without any downtime from one network architecture to another one. Luckily, eBay has done it already. So they've given us information on how to do it, and we'll be following that recipe. And this is one of those cases where large deployments can share experiences. And then looking at rolling out some additional projects, um, bare metal, getting full Magnum functionality. Um, people don't need to make their choice about what container orchestration they want to use. And going into potentially public cloud utilization as we look to be able to grow out past the usage of the Hungary data center. So, in summary, we've had three years production experience. Um, upgrades have been done in a transparent fashion for the uh, virtual machines running, a little bit of API downtime, but that's been able to be done. We've had scenarios where we've then been able to adjust the culture of the organization and the technology underneath through a fairly complex set of transitions, but we've now completed that interaction. And finally, it's thanks to communities such as yourselves that these transactions are possible. And in particular, all the collaborations that you've been providing, both in terms of taxpayers towards CERN and equally as contributors to upstream open source, are greatly appreciated. So thank you very much.